Hello, everyone. Let's see if I can get this going. Okay, can everybody see my presentation? Yeah. Yep. Good. Excellent. Uh, I want to thank everyone for the uh, invitation, the organizers, for giving me the opportunity to share some of this work for you today. Uh, as mentioned, I am from Queen's University, and I'll be talking about mitochondrial nuclear genetic interaction in health and disease. So I always like to lead these talks as a self-professed mitochondriac with a little bit of expectations versus reality. Perhaps not in this crowd, but in most crowds, if you ask anyone, what is the mitochondria? They have one answer. And that answer is that mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. That is true, but that is a woefully inaccurate description. And that's okay. That's what our job is to bring more mitochondrial biology to the masses. Similarly, when you ask people to picture mitochondria, what typically happens is this highly stylized fluorescent jelly bean just floating off in space. And while pretty, these images never do the mitochondria justice. For a little bit of reality now, this is what mitochondria look like in vascular smooth muscle cells labeled with a lumen filling red mitochondrial dye. You can see that mitochondria are actually this complicated network that span the entire volume of the cell. So you can imagine all of the communications and interactions with other organelles that the mitochondria are taking part in. And the little yellow dots that you see all along the track of the mitochondria are individual mitochondrial genomes that we can visualize. And we'll talk about just how important the little genome that could is in a little bit. So in addition to being, in my opinion, visually striking when we image them, the mitochondria also have a myriad of functions in our healthy physiology and in disease. Everything from how our body senses changes in environmental oxygen to cell-based and whole body metabolism, the production of reactive oxygen species, cell signaling pathways, calcium homeostasis, immunity, coordination of cell death, and a whole litany of things that I unfortunately don't have time to talk about today. So for today, we're going to talk about some of my work in cellular and whole body metabolism, as well as ROS production and cell signaling. So I like to look at this in the context of cardiometabolic disease. This is my primary research interest, and I won't belabor what the definition of cardiometabolic disease is. It is a syndrome or metabolic syndrome. It is a cluster diagnosis of multiple risk factors, such as abdominal obesity, dyslipidemia, high fasting levels of blood glucose, and you're at increased risk for cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. I don't need to tell this crowd why we're invested. We want to investigate cardiometabolic disease. It's epidemic across the entire planet with anywhere from 20 to 80% of adults classified as having one or more of these risk factors. And it is expensive. If we look at healthcare costs, lost wages in Canada and the United States, we're talking almost a billion dollars per person in the country in annual cardiometabolic disease and vascular disease spending. So, when we think about cardiometabolic risk, a lot of the things that come up are these traditional key players, including your age, sex, abdominal obesity, pre-existing type 2 diabetes, a sedentary lifestyle. These are all these traditional key players that everyone's been investigating for a very long time. But there are these emerging key players that are becoming predominant in cardiometabolic disease literature, and they include a lot of molecular targets, ROS production, inflammation, mitochondrial structure, fission, and fusion, as well as genetics and epigenetics. And it's these emerging key players that I'm going to talk about today. So we'll talk a little bit about the genetics of the mitochondrion right now and the genetics of cardiometabolic disease. We've known for years that single gene mutations that will cause obesity are increasingly rare. There have been fewer than 30 reported cases of leptin deficiency in humans, yet one of the most popular models of diet-induced obesity is the OBOB mouse, and there have been over 3,000 papers published since 1980. And similarly, the leptin receptor defect in the DBDB mouse, equally rare, and thousands of papers published in this model. And while preclinical models are increasingly important in driving human healthcare design, the CDC has known well before, but declared in 2012 that genetic changes in human populations occur just too slowly to be responsible for this epidemic. So, despite that, there's this interesting pattern of differential disease susceptibility when we look at different subpopulations of 
human beings. When we look at self-reported Caucasians, African Americans, Hispanic, and Aboriginal First Nations people, we see there are disparate levels of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and, and cardiovascular disease in African Americans specifically and Hispanic populations. And when we control for as many socioeconomic factors as possible, access to healthcare, education, other socioeconomic factors, and you know, access to food, things like that, none of those things actually explain what this difference is, nor do large genome-wide association studies of the nuclear genome. However, with that, we can enter the realm of mitochondrial DNA to hopefully answer some of these questions. So for the uninitiated, mitochondria have their own genome. It is comparatively much smaller than the nuclear genome. It is a circular double-stranded genome that encodes for 13 polypeptides that are major structural or catalytic subunits of the electron transport chain, as well as its own replication machinery and a very primitive repair mechanism. So it's changes in this DNA sequence that are the focus of my research and how we can delineate different human subpopulations by differences in this sequence. So why do I think that there's a role for mitochondrial DNA in obesity and cardiometabolic disease? If we look at some of the hallmarks of mitochondrial DNA, it's maternal inheritance, it's more prone to damage than the nuclear genome, it lacks that protective wrapping of histones and a complex repair mechanism. There is a documented functional decline with age that is associated with an accumulation of mitochondrial DNA damage. And importantly, mitochondrial DNA shows geographic variation. So if we look at some of those hallmarks of obesity and metabolic syndrome, documented maternal history crops up, as does an increase in oxidative DNA damage across multiple tissues, your risk increases with age, and there are those documented racial disparities that I just spoke of. So to expand on this just for a moment, because I recognize that I'm in the minority of people who spend a lot of their time looking at the geographic variation of mitochondrial DNA. I'm going to throw out some words that are going to come up for the rest of my presentation, mainly haplogroup. But to define those two things, a haplotype is one specific sequence of mitochondrial DNA. Unless we've got any siblings in the audience today, we all have our own mitochondrial haplotype, a specific sequence delineated here by these codes on the right. If we follow these phylogenetic trees backwards, we get to subhaplogroups until we get all the way up to haplogroup Q in this example, which is a group of regional haplotypes that all share a common ancestor. So with this in mind of what a haplogroup is, mitochondrial haplogroups have been used to map humans migration out of Africa. And interestingly, back in 2004, Ruiz Pacini et al. documented an increase in missense mutations in the mitochondrial genome as populations moved northward out of Africa. And the hypothesis is that this occurred because our mitochondria have many jobs, but three of the main jobs are the generation of molecular energy, the generation of oxidants, and the generation of heat. And it was proposed that the increase in missense mutations as populations moved north was to increase the generation of body heat. So based on that hypothesis, this idea of mitochondrial economy, how efficient do the mitochondria work to generate energy and how much do they lose in heat, led to the proposal of using oxygen to generate ATP and a definition of economy. So by that virtue, high economy populations, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa that subsisted mainly on a diet of fruits and vegetables and plants, could generate more ATP with less oxygen consumed. And in contrast, a low economy, more northern or European haplogroup, now their diet changed as they migrated out of Africa and fish and protein and fat became a primary source of nutrition and as such the added stress of having to generate heat led to this lower economy where more oxygen was required to generate the same amount of ATP because there was mitochondrial leak to generate body heat. So this leads to the mitochondrial paradigm of disease and these evolutionary stresses. If we think about those ancient populations, we think of hunter-gathering populations that had a high energy demand, unpredictable eating habits, and this constant temperature stress, where a high or low economy was very beneficial depending on geographically where you were. The problem is if we take that ancient programming and put it into modern day society, we don't have any more of those evolutionary stresses. Human beings comparatively lead a very sedentary lifestyle. Typically, we have constant caloric excess and we have climate control. 
So with that, if we go back to the original jobs of the mitochondrion and the paradigm of disease, if we don't need to generate heat and we don't need to generate ATP, what's going to happen? We're going to front load that system and only be generating oxidants, which physiologically we need them for cell signaling. But at pathologic levels, these can cause numerous problems across multiple tissues. So with that in mind, we can look at primary cell lines from individuals of diverging haplogroups, particularly haplogroup H, which is the most common Caucasian haplogroup from Europe and in the Americas, and haplogroup L, which encompasses modern-day African Americans, as well as sub-Saharan African populations. And if we look at the definition of mitochondrial economy and ROS production, we can see that haplogroup L, those high economy sub-Saharan haplogroups that were proposed to use less oxygen to generate ATP, indeed do. They can generate more ATP per oxygen consumed, or they consume less to make the same amount. Similarly, if we look at aconitase activity, which is inversely proportional to ROS production as an indirect measure of ROS production, we can see that haplogroup H has increased aconitase activity indicative of less ROS production. So with that in mind, this is great in a cell model, but how can we actually test this paradigm in a preclinical model? Well, we turned to the laboratory mouse, which what you're looking at right now is a phylogenetic tree of the mitochondrial genome of a mouse. And that mitochondrial genome actually segregates with documented differential susceptibility to diet-induced cardiometabolic disease, where the C57 mice are highly susceptible and the C3H mice are highly resistant. And I'm sure for everyone listening, you've just caught on, well, that sounds like control populations. Those mice are completely different from one another. You're not going to be able to establish any changes based solely on mitochondrial DNA. So in order to localize to mitochondria-specific changes, we developed the mitochondrial nuclear exchange mouse or minx mouse. And the way we did this was by taking wild type susceptible C57 mice and resistant C3H mice fertilizing those wild type embryos, enucleating and swapping the nuclei of those embryos, hence mitochondrial nuclear exchange, and the resulting progeny look like their nucleus, but they have the mitochondrion of the opposing mouse. So in theory, we have made a C3H mouse with susceptible mitochondria and a C57 mouse with resistant mitochondria. So in order to characterize what actually happens in these mice, we started at the molecular level. Do the effects on the actual organelle track with your mitochondrion or do the host of nuclear genes that actually encode for the structure and function of the mitochondrion override just that little change in the mitochondrial genome? We started by looking at just organelle function. And if we look first at ATP production, we can see that C57 wild type mice are indeed a preclinical model of those high economy human populations in that they generate more ATP than the less economical C3H mouse. However, ATP production tracks perfectly with mitochondrial genetic background. And when we swap mitochondria, we can swap ATP production in heart mitochondria. So in a highly active skeletal muscle mitochondrion, we can completely change how they generate energy. Similarly, if we look at reactive oxygen species, we see that that high economy mitochondrial population is associated with more reactive oxygen species, and we can in turn also change that. We can make a susceptible mouse produce less ROS, and we can make a resistant mouse produce more. So, okay, so we have this now in a mitochondrial model, but what's actually happening in vivo and what's happening in context of cardiovascular and metabolic disease. I chose to work primarily on obesity as my one factor that I wanted to look at for now. And we used these minx mice and fed them either a Western style, moderately high fat, moderately high carbohydrate diet compared to chow and wanted to determine what their mitochondrial metabolic function looked like in vivo in the whole animal. So for color coding, the green C3H mitochondria represent the resistant phenotype and the C57 mitochondria represent the susceptible phenotype. And to measure mitochondrial economy in a living creature, we use the amount of voluntary activity per ATP consumed by virtue of looking at activity per VO2. And you can see again that the wild type susceptible mouse is a high economy 
environment. It's a high economy mitochondrion, high economy tissues, and they are much more metabolically efficient. And while the swap is never 100% perfect in an in vivo model system, we can see that we can increase metabolic efficiency and economy in that C3H mouse by changing its mitochondrion. And the inverse is also true. We can reduce metabolic efficiency and mitochondrial economy in the, excuse me, in the C57 mouse just by changing its mitochondria. There were no changes nuclearly that we induced and only changing that one little organelle is changing whole body what happens metabolic efficiency wise. So this is that baseline. What happens when we feed them a diet? We were able to induce diet-induced obesity in an exacerbated way in a resistant C3H mouse. So if we tracked weight gain over time, in chow and high fat fed wild type C3H mice. This is a chow fed wild type animal. And this second line here is a wild type C3H mouse on high fat diet. You can see from the first open circle line that the presence of C57 mitochondrial DNA put a chow fed minx mouse on par with a fat fed wild type mouse. And that this weight gain phenotype is exacerbated when you give the minx mouse high fat diet. What is this weight gain? Of course, mice grow over time. They get heavier. The weight gain is primarily associated with a change in fat. So you can see wild type mice on high fat diet. Of course, they gain body fat. And you can see that this is exacerbated even on chow by the presence of C57 mitochondrial DNA and further exacerbated again by the presence of high fat diet, showing sort of a two hit hypothesis with respect to mitochondrial genetic background and diet. So we next wanted to know, is the inverse true? Could we rescue the high economy, high ROS, more susceptible phenotype by giving them resistant mitochondrial DNA? So in order to do that, we're now switching to the C57 susceptible mouse background. And you can see there were no significant changes over time with respect to body weight when we gave these animals either chow or high fat diet. And similarly, when we looked at total body fat, of course, when an animal is fed high fat diet, they put on body fat and there were no significant changes by providing a chow diet to the minx mouse. However, we were able to attenuate fat deposition during high fat feeding. So to a degree, we're starting to discover that the presence of a different mitochondrial genome is affecting multiple aspects of metabolism. In order to investigate why this was happening, specifically in the body fat, we decided to look at gene expression, nuclear gene expression in these animals, and determine what role a mitochondrial DNA switch would play in gene expression. So we did RNA sequencing of the inguinal and epididymal white adipose tissue, and in the interest of time, I will only show a brief summary of this data. We showed that the presence of susceptible C57 mitochondrial DNA was associated with a change in almost 4,000 nuclear genes. And these animals were both fed the same diet. So when you compare them to their chow controls, the presence of C57 mitochondrial DNA resulted in this large change in nuclear gene expression in the adipose tissue alone. Similarly, when we gave the susceptible mouse resistant mitochondrial DNA, we reduced the number of nuclear genes that were changed upon giving that animal high fat diet. And again, the presence of susceptible mitochondrial DNA led to an almost tenfold increase in the nuclear genes that were changed. And what were some of those genes that were changed is a question we get a lot. What's interesting is it ran the gamut. And a lot of the genes you'll see, I just selected a small suite here, are associated with different substrate metabolism, carbohydrate, fatty acid metabolism, pyruvate metabolism, and also differences in some atherogenic genes and inflammation, angiotensin, et cetera. We unfortunately were left at the end of this particular project with a how is this happening? How is the mitochondrion communicating with the nuclear genome in order to change the expression of nuclear genes? And thankfully, a group in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania is making some headway in primary cells. And they're doing this not in cardiometabolic disease, which is a complex polygenic disease, but using rare mitochondrial diseases as a model, whereby one single point mutation induces a severe myopathy at a dose-dependent penetrance manner. And just 
for the uninitiated, heteroplasmy is just the presence of multiple DNA sequences within a tissue. So you can see here is an example of a sequencing reaction. And at this locus here, there is a presence of a G and also there are genomes that have an A instead. So the design of this particular experiment was to dose dependently increase heteroplasmy over time and see what happens to nuclear gene expression. So they had a model of only an A, an A to a G, and then, oh, there was more G than A. And what they ended up finding on a cellular level in mito rare mitochondrial diseases is actually that nuclear gene expression is regulated by mitochondrial DNA through metabolites. So through meta untargeted metabolomic screening, they were able to dose-dependently increase heteroplasmy over here on this top axis, and then measure changes in alpha-ketoglutarate succinate, which everyone will recognize are Krebs cycle intermediates and substrates. That changes in acetyl-CoA and histone acetylation is resulting in downstream transcriptional alterations, which are leading to a larger distinct clinical phenotype. So now this is came out at the end of last year, and this is what's happening in rare mitochondrial diseases on a cellular level. What's happening in minx mice, we don't yet know. That is something that I'm going to carry forward uh, in my research program, so hopefully I'll be able to keep everybody posted on what's happening in the minx mice with respect to how mitochondrial DNA is regulating gene expression. So to summarize, I hope I have demonstrated today that the mitochondrial genome has geographic variation that may help explain CMD susceptibility in human populations, that laboratory mice are a suitable preclinical model that will need to be coupled with human cell studies and also clinical research with different human subpopulations, that the reciprocal exchange of mitochondrial DNA does change either resistance or susceptibility to disease that mtDNA can regulate the expression of these genes via metabolites, and this mitochondrial paradigm of disease is a real perspective shift for cardiometabolic disease epidemiology, and that interaction and communication between the two genomes is probably key to understanding aspects of health and most diseases. So with that, I would like to thank my current laboratory, uh, the lab of Dr. Stephen Archer, my previous lab at UAB, our collaborators, and if I don't get, hopefully there are questions, and if we don't get to all of them, uh, I am happy to take emails from anyone. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. That's a really interesting talk. Um, we do, do already have a couple questions online, so we have five minutes for questions. The first is from Morel Cacho. Uh, great talk. The differences you were describing in terms of mitochondrial efficiency and ROS levels have been linked to changes in electron transport chain respiratory supercomplexes. For example, C57 mice are known to make less ETC supercomplexes. Have you looked at ETC supercomplex assembly in these different conditions? Uh, that's an excellent question. Thank you. We haven't gotten quite to supercomplex and respirosome construction yet, and it's something I'm hoping to carry forward in multiple cell lines we've extracted from these mice. I do know that baseline complex activity is also different from these in these animals, and particularly we find most changes in complex four which would make sense when we're talking about oxygen consumption, but that's definitely something we want to do moving forward. Um, now, Aisha Salim asks, can you comment on the recent papers on mitochondrial DNA coming from fathers as well as mothers, and if that changes our interpretation of the mitochondrial DNA haplogroup origins? Hmm. That's an excellent question, and I haven't seen any of the recent papers other than the classic theory of paternal inheritance of mitochondrial DNA typically occurs during fertilization when a piece of the sperm midpiece enters the oocyte at fertilization. But typically, due to mathematics and out competition, this doesn't happen. And for the longest time, there was a New England Journal paper that described a single incidence of paternal inheritance of mitochondrial DNA. Interestingly, it was in, it ended up in the skeletal muscle progenitor population, and it was a skeletal muscle specific phenotype. And this patient had multiple myopathies and they were very ill with energetic disease. I'm thinking that the rarity of it, it's not, it is equally important, but this is going to be a population that are going to likely have to be considered separate from classic haplogroup migration studies and that we might need to consider 
whether there is a dosing effect if, that we can quantify if there is global heteroplasmy, what is the level? And that might help us with interpreting if it was H and L, just to use the example we talked about today, the first thing would probably be to know roughly percentage H versus percentage L. And that person may indeed need to be classified as an HL or an LH, but it's definitely something to probably keep my finger on the pulse of, despite the fact that it's only a couple individuals right now, but that's okay. Great. Uh, we have one more question from uh, Peter Bax. Uh, great talk. Have you examined levels of ROS in the obesity studies, given that obesity seems to be a highly oxidative state? So we unfortunately, when we pulled the adipose tissue, it was a comedy of errors when we originally did that study. But I'm hoping that when we have the next new crop of mice that we're going to be able to do some more sensitive spin trapping to not only quantify ROS production across tissues in the diet-induced obesity model, but we're also going to be more specific about which ROS we're looking at. Because as, again, as a self-described mitochondriac and a free radical biologist, not specifying what ROS you look at is one of my pet peeves. So I always try and make sure I explain, well, DCF, we're measuring auto oxidation of multiple ROS or looking specifically for superoxide versus hydrogen peroxide and proxynitrite. So it's something I want to do and actually categorize which ROS species we're talking about, because I think that's going to change interpretation of the data. Right. Great. Thank you very much.